Good morning, afternoon, or evening. Dr. Richardson here, Lecture 2. Now, in Lecture 1, we introduced you to the levels of organization of matter. And starting with Lecture 2, we are now going to climb up that ladder. This lecture is going to talk about elements, atoms, and molecules. Now, er, wait a second. I thought this was biology. Please remember that biologists must rely on other science disciplines to help us understand living organisms. So chemistry is the study of substances, what matter is made out of, and how these substances interact during chemical reactions. So since living organisms are made out of matter, we do need to spend a lecture talking about some chemistry concepts. Don't panic. After this, uh, the chemistry stuff will kind of fade away. But we do have to talk about it because we're, we're understanding life from the ground up. So uh, recall from lecture one that all matter, living and non-living things, are made of elements. An element is a substance, stuff, that can neither be separated into anything simpler nor changed into anything else. Oxygen, for example, can't be boiled down to something less than oxygen. It's just oxygen. Nor can it change from oxygen to nitrogen. Oxygen is oxygen. So that's the definition of an element. You can't break it down into anything simpler, and you can't change it into anything else. Now, there are 98 elements that occur naturally in this world, and believe it or not, scientists have actually been able to create 20 more in the laboratory. Now, I know that most of you, if not all of you, have seen this before. This is called the periodic table of the elements. It's the way that chemists organize elements and so we borrow this and you see here there's oxygen there's carbon there's nitrogen there are you know over a hundred of these different elements as biologists we focus a lot on uh, the stuff that's in gray hydrogen carbon nitrogen oxygen this is phosphorus silicone and so a lot of living things are, are made out of the stuff in gray. Luckily, we don't have to focus on a lot of that stuff, but I'm just trying to get you comfortable with elements, and there they are. Now, atoms are the smallest unit of matter. So, you have an atom of oxygen again, for example. You never have half an atom, a quarter atom, there's an atom. Now, atoms have structure that we need to learn because the structure of these atoms and how they interact with each other is what makes us alive. So at the core of our beings, if we zoom in far enough, we're all just atoms interacting with each other. So let's learn about atoms. And you'll notice Richardson is a fan of these uh, hand-drawn pictures and they will go along with what we're reading on the slide. So atoms are composed or made up of three types of particles. Protons, neutrons, and electrons. Protons are positively charged particles. You've all played with maybe magnets before, or you've put batteries into things, and batteries have a plus end and a minus end. This is referring to the charge of something. So a proton is a positively charged particle in an atom, and it's located in the central atomic nucleus, or the center of the atom. And you see a little circle with a plus two of them, and these are protons, positively charged, and I put a little plus there. Next, we have neutrons. Neutron sounds like neutral, so neutrons are neutrally charged particles, again, located in the central atomic nucleus. 
These have no charge. They're not positive. They're not negative. They're neutral. And you see those illustrated here with a circle with a zero in it, meaning no charge, neutral charge. Finally, the third type of particle in an atom is an electron. And this is a negatively charged particle that actually is circling in an orbit in space around this central atomic nucleus. So one more time, we have protons, positively charged, in the middle. Neutrons, neutral, no charge, in the middle and electrons negatively charged swirling around the center atomic nucleus. Show you a couple pictures because pictures do it better than Richardson can draw. Neutrons, protons, electrons swirling around the outside and just one more again with the protons and neutrons in the center and the electrons swirling around the outside. Now, let's build on that. The electrons swirling around are capable of interacting with electrons from other atoms. And this is the basis of chemical reactions. When electrons from different atoms interact, we have a chemical reaction. Now, this picture is showing in pictures what happens when the electrons of atoms interact. Here we have two hydrogen molecules. And they come with these two little balls here. And here we have a molecule of oxygen. And what you see over here is these two red balls have broken apart. These four gray balls have broken apart. And now we have two of the gray balls connected with a red ball. Two of them. And what we've just done is we've made water. Water is H2O, two H's and an O. That is a molecule of water. And so is this. But how we got there, how did we get there? Well, here are two hydrogen atoms and their electrons are playing with each other. Same here. Here's two molecules of, two atoms of oxygen and they're playing with each other. But what happens is they've disconnected from each other and reconnected in different ways. And that's a chemical reaction. Atoms interacting and making new things. Now when you see a chemical reaction like this, we need to let you know that everything on the left side are the reactants, the stuff that's going to interact in the chemical reaction. And on the right side are the products, what we make. So we took two hydrogens and an oxygen and we made two H2Os. Very simple. One more time, just to show you, in a chemical reaction, on the left side, reactants. Don't worry about memorizing the reaction. I just want you to appreciate reactants, what's going to play together, and products, what's the result. And a chemical reaction like this must always be balanced. You see four red circles here, still have four here. You see four green ones here, still have four green ones here, one yellow, one yellow. So these chemical reactions, reactants, products, always balanced. They're going to move around and do different things, but always balanced. Now, let's talk about atomic number for a second. Every element has an atomic number. And the atomic number is the number of protons in the nucleus of the atoms of that element. And these atomic numbers are listed for each element on the periodic table. 
that we saw a little earlier. Uh, now, there are usually, for our purposes, let's make it easy, the same number of protons, neutrons, and electrons in each element and each atom. What do you mean by that? We'll get to it. So for example, here is the card of, for carbon from the periodic table. And right here is listed the atomic number. So carbon has atomic number six, which means there are one, two, three, four, five, six protons in the atom but there's going to be an equal number of neutrons and electrons. One, two, three, four, five, six neutrons, and one, two, three, four, five, six electrons. So again, atomic number gives you the number of protons, and the number of protons in that carbon atom will also be the same number of protons neutrons and electrons. All three the same. Okay? Now, let's talk a little bit more about these electrons because the truth is the protons and the neutrons are stuck in the middle. They don't get to party much. They don't get to do very much. It's the electrons that have all the fun. And as we said, the electrons are circling around the protons and neutrons and they travel kind of like on think of them as freeways but they're in these shells electron shells and these are fixed paths fixed roads fixed freeways around the nucleus where the electrons will travel they just go around and around all day long forever and ever now, you see it on a piece of paper, uh, which is only two-dimensional, but these electrons can actually be three-dimensional, and they're swirling in all directions around the nucleus. Three-dimensional pathways around the nucleus. But there are some rules about these electron shells. For example, how many electrons can fit in each shell on each road around the central nucleus. Well, the first shell, and please draw your attention to my picture drawn down here, the first shell closest to the atomic nucleus can hold a maximum of two electrons. Does it always have two? <clears throat> well, that depends on the element. If the element is an atomic number one, and it only has one electron, then there's only going to be one electron traveling on this road. If the element has atomic number two, then there will be two electrons traveling on that road. What if the atomic number is three? If only two electrons can travel on this first road, then the third electron will have to go to the second road, the second electron shell. And this shell can hold a maximum of eight electrons. But what if the atom has an atomic number of 11? Well, two of the electrons will drive on the first road, Eight of them, two plus eight is ten, eight of them will travel on the second road, but the eleventh, the final electron, will have to travel on the outer road. So it's kind of like getting in the minivan, right? Two kids can sit in the seat right behind mom, but eight kids maximum can sit on the second, and eight maximum in the third, and eight and eight and eight going out forever. So, again, this causes people some confusion, but for the electrons, they travel in these shells, but each shell can hold only so many electrons. So depending on the atomic number 
how many protons, neutrons, and electrons the whole atom has, you should be able to tell me how many electrons will be traveling in each shell. Let's show you another slide just to make sure it's clear. So again, these shells are like concentric circles, one circle and then another and another. Again, here's our central atomic nucleus. Our protons are there. Our neutrons are there. Electrons floating around in the roads around it. First shell holds maximum two. Second shell can hold a maximum of eight. Third shell can hold a maximum of eight. So if you remember, two, eight, eight, you'll get it down. Maximum two, maximum eight, maximum eight. Finally, let's just show you one more thing. Here's the electron shells for various elements. Now hydrogen is atomic number one. So there's only one nucleus. Sorry, there's only one proton. There's one neutron in the nucleus. And look at that, one little lonely electron in the first shell. Here's carbon, atomic number six. Six protons, six neutrons here. And we are gonna have how many electrons? Six, first shell, already full with two. So the other four electrons are in the second shell. Let's look, uh, jump down here to sulfur. This is atomic number 16. So remember, 288, there's going to be two electrons in the first shell, eight in the second. We're now at 10. So we have six electrons in the outermost shell. Please go over this again if it's not clear. It should be very easy for you if I give you the atomic number for you to tell me how many electrons will be placed in each shell, all right? We never go out past three shells, two, eight, eight. If you want more shells, take a chemistry class. All right, now we're building on this now because now we're gonna go to something a bit more complex. Atoms can be either reactive or inert. Reactive sounds like active. Inert, it's kind of sitting there, not doing much. So, if an atom's outermost shell, the one farthest from the atomic nucleus, is full of electrons, that atom is inert, and it's not going to react with other atoms. The idea is, you as an atom, will only do a chemical reaction if your outermost electron shell is only partially full. If there's still room in your outermost shell for more electrons, you're ready to party, you're ready to do a chemical reaction, you're ready to form a bond with another atom. And atoms that have an outermost shell that's only partially full are called reactive because they want to react and do chemical reactions. Now, how do these reactions happen? We're going to talk about a couple different two types of reactions. But one way that atoms interact and form bonds is when one atom takes an electron from another atom. Another way is when an electron gives an electron away. And a third type is when two atoms share an electron. We're going to get into it with some pictures to make sure that's clear. But one more time, if the atom's outermost shell is full, that atom is inert and it will not do chemical reactions. Atoms will only do chemical reactions if their outermost electron shell is only partially full. Let's go back to this slide for a second. Now remember, 288, right? So if hydrogen is atomic number one, 
and the first shell can hold a maximum of two electrons. And if hydrogen only has one electron, is hydrogen reactive? Yes. Okay. Let's look at carbon. 288. We've got six. So we've got two in the first shell. We've got four in the second shell. But how many can that second shell hold? Eight. So there's room for how many more? Four more. Carbon wants to party. Okay, hopefully the reactive and inert is uh, starting to make sense. All right, good. Now we're going to move up and talk about molecules. Because when two or more atoms bond together, we have a molecule, and a molecule results from a chemical reaction. Now, molecules come in different types. And we like to organize molecules by whether or not they will dissolve in water and whether or not they contain carbon. So if there is a molecule that does not dissolve in water, we call that molecule hydrophobic. There's something about that molecule that will not allow it to dissolve in water. Molecules that will dissolve in water we call hydrophilic because if you drop it in water, it's going to dissolve. We also, though, divide molecules by whether they're organic or inorganic molecules. An organic molecule is a molecule that contains at least one atom of carbon. And organic molecules are found in living organisms. An inorganic molecule is a molecule that doesn't have any carbon in it. NaCl, sodium chloride, is salt. That's made up of a sodium and a chloride, no carbon. Water, H2O, there's no carbon there, so inorganic. Please be comfortable with these terms. Hydrophobic molecules, hydrophilic molecules, organic molecules, inorganic molecules. I will use those terms in future lectures. When atoms interact to form molecules, bonds are formed. And there's two major types of chemical bonds that can occur between two atoms. Ionic bonds and covalent bonds. And we're going to finish up this lecture by talking about the two types of bonds, showing you how they happen, and then we'll be done for today. So, here's an ionic bond example. I'm going to refer to the picture and the words to bring it all together. So, let's get started. We first have a sodium atom. And I'm telling you there's 11 electrons, 11 protons. So, the atomic number is 11. And we have chloride. 17 electrons, 17 protons, atomic number 17. So let's look at them over here. Sodium, Na, atomic number 11. I wrote my 11 Ps for protons, 11 Ns for neutrons, and now you know we have 11 electrons. So here we go. Two in the first shell, maximum two. Eight in the second shell, maximum eight. And one lonely electron in the third shell. How many electrons can that shell hold? Eight. There's only one, so it has room for seven. And if you don't like the picture, it's also here. Sodium, two electrons in first shell, eight in the second shell, one electron in the third shell. Now let's look at chloride. 
atomic number 17. Very simple if you remember, 288, right? So we got 17 protons and neutrons, and first shell, two electrons hanging out, second shell, eight electrons hanging out, third shell, seven, two plus eight plus seven equals 17. So again, focusing on the outermost shell, there's seven electrons and there's room for one more. Now, isn't it interesting that there's room for one more here and in this outer shell, there's one. It's almost perfect, isn't it? So what happens in this ionic bond is the chloride is going to take this lonely, hey, come on, kid, you can come over here and hang out with us. So the outermost shell will now be full with eight, right? So if sodium donated, gave away this one lonely electron in its outermost shell, then imagine if this wasn't here, then we just have two and eight and the outermost shell would be full. So if sodium donated one electron, it would be more stable, right? Because it would have two full shells. And just the same way, if chloride took this electron, over here, we now have two, eight, and eight, and the chloride would be happy too because its outermost shell would be full. We're happiest when our shells are full. When the shells are not full, we want to interact and do stuff. So the result of this ionic bond is chloride is going to take a sodium electron into its outer shell. And here below the line, we now see after the bonding has taken place, and while we still have 11 protons and 11 neutrons, now the sodium really only has 10 electrons, two and eight, because it gave its lonely electron over here. And now the chloride is also happy because it's got a full outermost shell. please go over this a couple times if it's not clear. You've got to understand the structure of the atom. You have to understand the electron shells, the two, eight, and eight. And then you have to understand what's happening when they're bonding. Sodium is giving an electron to the chloride. Now, Within this bond that's happening here, something a bit more complex is happening, and let's go over it. The sodium atom, if we look at this side of the molecule now, this is a whole molecule, but if we look at this side of it, the pluses and minuses are a little bit off because we have 11 Ps, protons, positives, but we only have 2 plus 8, 10 electron negatives. So the sodium side of the molecule is more positively charged because there's 11 pluses and only 10 negatives. And that's how you see the plus on the sodium side of the molecule because on this side it's a little uneven. 11 pluses 10 minuses. Overall, it's more plus. The chloride side is more negative because we still have 17 pluses, 17 protons, but now we have 2 plus 8 plus 8, 18 negatives. And this plus minus is what actually holds this bond together. An ionic bond is the holding together of atoms as a result of this give and take and now this kind of uneven charge on each side. All right, let's show you it in pictures. Here's our sodium. It doesn't show you the 11 pluses and neutrons, but you can see two electrons in the first shell, 
eight electrons in the second shell, one lonely electron in the third shell. Chloride, two in first shell, eight in second shell, seven with room for one more in the third shell. Ionic bond forms, sodium gives the lonely electron to the chloride, and now, although those two things, you don't see them like stuck together, they are bonded together. And the sodium side has one less electron and the chloride side has one extra electron, making this side more positive and this side more negative. And there you have your ionic bond. Finally today, we're going to talk about covalent bonds. <clears throat> now, a covalent bond results not from giving, taking, but sharing. It's like a potluck. Everybody brings a dish and we all share our food. So let's look at a covalent bond example. All right, what do we got over here? Well, we have one carbon atom, atomic number six, six protons, six neutrons, two electrons in the first shell, four electrons in the second, two plus four gives us six. We have room for four more electrons in the second shell because it holds a maximum of eight. And we've got four hydrogen atoms. Hydrogen is atomic number one with one proton, one neutron, one lonely electron swirling around in the first shell of each of the four hydrogen atoms. So what's going to happen in a covalent bond is each hydrogen will share its electron. And if we share one, two, three, four, what's that going to do to that carbon shell? It's going to be full, right? So here's what the molecule looks like at the end of the chemical reaction. Four electrons from H atoms are shared with the carbon atom. So this second shell of the carbon is now full because it's sharing the four electrons with each of the four hydrogens. In chemistry, they would draw it like this, the C with these four lines bonded to the H's. But what's actually happening is each of these hydrogens is sharing. So the electron will hang out in its own home, but the electron will also hang out in the carbon shell. It might hang out here for a while, and then hang out there for a while. So they're sharing it. I'll go on your road, and then I'll go on this road, then I'll go on your road, then I'll go on this road, and that's the sharing part of it. Here's a picture, might look better than Richardson can draw. This molecule, by the way, is called methane, cow's fart methane, if you didn't know. <laughs> uh, lots of good trivia in biology. And again, this is showing your carbon. It's not showing the first shell with the two, it's illustrating that in the second shell, the carbon had its own four red ones, and it's now sharing the four pink ones from the hydrogen molecules. Atoms. All right. I'd like you to pause for a minute and watch this quick YouTube video because it will illustrate and animate how atoms bond. Nice little video, it's only a couple minutes long, and we'll see you when you come back. Pause this video, watch it, and come on back. All right, now, because this is biology, we are going to focus from now on on organic molecules. And organic molecules from a few slides ago, the definition was organic molecules have at least one atom of carbon. So what's the big deal about carbon? Well, the fact that it's atomic number six with two electrons in its first shell, four in the outer shell, and room for four more is rather unique because it allows carbon 
to form many different types of bonds. Single bonds, double bonds, triple bonds, even molecules that have a chain shape, a ring shape, branched shapes, really different variety. And because carbon can make a lot of different variety of molecules, these molecules are very dynamic. They do a lot of stuff and they are important for living organisms. If we didn't have carbon, we couldn't do glucose breakdown and make ATP, we wouldn't be alive. Plants could not do photosynthesis, they would not be alive. So if we didn't have carbon, we wouldn't be here, period. And carbon is the most important element when it comes to living organisms. Uh, as I said, carbon can form single bonds, carbon can form double bonds, carbon can form triple bonds, very versatile. It can do a lot of different things and atoms and molecules combining in different ways is the basis of life because all we are is a bag of chemical reactions happening all the time. All right, finally, we wanna introduce you to the topic of a functional group. A functional group is one or more reactive atoms, atoms that want to party, atoms that want to do chemical reactions, ionic bonds, covalent bonds, that attach to molecules and will help that molecule do specific chemical reactions. And these functional groups, whatever molecule you stick them on, that molecule will then be able to do a specific chemical reaction. Now, if we were biology majors, or if we were in a chemistry class, we would need to learn a bunch of functional groups. There's nearly 200 of them. I'm not concerned with you knowing the names of them, just the concept. When you attach a functional group to a molecule, that molecule can now go and do specific chemical reactions. I would love it if you would watch this little video, which shows you about functional groups and helps you to visualize the concept that if I attach this group of reactive atoms to this organic molecule, then wow, that organic molecule can do some pretty cool and different chemical reactions that will support a living organism in being alive. All right, and finally, yes, this video that you're watching right now is going to be attached here and posted on YouTube. There you have it, lecture two. See you next time.